<laughs> oh yeah. I'm gonna read Louise Erdich today. I'm gonna read the first chapter of her book, Tracks. Um, looks like this. Chapter one, winter, 1912. Little spirit son, Nanapush. We started dying before the snow, and like the snow, we continued to fall. It was surprising there were so many of us left to die. For those who survived the spotted sickness from the south, our long fight went to Nadusio land, where we signed the treaty and then a wind from the east bringing exile in a storm of government papers. What descended from the north in 1912 seemed impossible. By then, we thought disaster must surely have spent its force, that disease must have claimed all the Anishinaabe that the earth could hold and bury. But the earth is limitless and so is luck, and so were our people once. Granddaughter, you are the child of the invisible, the ones who disappeared when, along with the first bitter punishments of early winter, a new sickness swept down. The consumption, it was called by young Father Damien, who came in that year to replace the priest who succumbed to the same devastation as his flock. This disease was different from the pox and fever, for it came on slow. The outcome, however, was just as certain. Whole families of your relatives lay ill and helpless in its breath. On the reservation, where we were forced close together, the clans dwindled. Our tribe unraveled like a coarse rope, frayed at either end, as the old and new among us were taken. My own family was wiped out one by one, leaving only Nanapush. And after, although I had lived mo no more than 50 winters, I was considered an old man. I'd seen enough to be one. In the years I'd passed, I'd saw more change in a hundred upon hundred. I saw more change than in a hundred upon a hundred before. My girl, I saw the passing of times you will never know. I guided the last buffalo hunt. I saw the last bear shot. I trapped the last beaver with a pelt of more than two years growth. I spoke aloud the words of the government treaty and refused to sign the settlement papers that would take away our woods and lake. I axed the last birch that was older than I, and I saved the last pillager. Fleur, the one you will not call mother. We found her on a cold afternoon in late winter out in your family's cabin near Machimanito Lake, where my companion, Edgar Pukwan of the tribal police, was afraid to go. The water there was surrounded by the highest oaks, by the woods inhabited by ghosts and roamed by pillagers who knew the secret ways to cure or kill until their art deserted them. Dragging our sled into the clearing, we saw two things. The smokeless tim chimney spout jutting from the roof and the empty hole in the door where the string was drawn inside. Pukwan did not want to enter, fearing the unburied pillager spirits might seize him by the throat and turn him windigo. So I was the one who broke the thin scraped hide that made a window. 
I was the one who lowered himself into the stinking silence onto the floor. I was also the one to find the old man and woman, your grandparents, the little brother and two sisters, stone cold and wrapped in gray horse blankets, their faces turned to the west. Afra afraid as I was, stilled by their quiet forms, I touched each bundle in the gloom of the cabin and wished each spirit a good journey on the three-day road, the old-time road, so well trampled by our people this deadly season. Then something in the corner knocked. I flung the door wide. It was the eldest daughter, Fleur, about 17 years old then. She was so feverish she'd thrown off her covers and now she huddled against the cold wood range, staring and shaking. She was wild as a filthy wolf, a big bony girl whose sudden bursts of strength and snarling cries terrified the listening Pukwan. So again, I was the one who struggled to lash her to the sacks of supplies and to the boards of the sled. I wrapped more blankets over her and tied them down as well. Pukwon kept us back, convinced he should carry out the agency's instructions to the letter. He carefully nailed up the official quarantine sign, and then, without removing the bodies, he tried to burn down the house. But though he threw kerosene repeatedly against the logs and even started a blaze with birch bark and chips of wood. The flames narrowed and shrank, went out in puffs of wood. Pukwan cursed and looked desperate, caught between his official duties and his fear of pillagers. The last one out. He finally dropped the tinders and helped me drag Fleur along the trail. And so we left five dead at Manito frozen behind their cabin door. There are some who say Pukwan and I should have done right and buried the pillagers first thing. They say the unrest and curse of trouble that struck our people in the years that followed was the doing of dissatisfied spirits. I know it's fact and have never been afraid of talking. Our trouble came from living from liquor and the dollar bill. We stumbled towards the government bait, never looking down, never noticing how the land was snatched from under us at every step. When it came Edgar Pukwan's turn to draw the sled, he took off like devils chased him, blounced Fleur over potholes as if she were a log and tipped her twice into the snow. I followed the sled encouraged Fleur with songs, cried at Pukwan to watch her hidden branches and deceptive drops, and finally got her to my cabin, a small, tightly tamped box overlooking the crossroads. Help me, I cried, cutting at the ropes, not even bothering with knots. Fleur closed her eyes, panted, and tossed her head side to side. Her chest rattled as she strained for air, she grabbed me around the neck. Still weak from my own sickness, I staggered, fell, lurched into my cabin, wrestling the strong girl inside with me. I had no wind left over to curse Pukwan, who watched but refused to touch her, turned away and vanished with the whole sled of supplies. It did not, it did not surprise me or cause me enduring sorrow when later, Pukwan's son, also named Edgar, also of the tribal police, told me that his father came home, crawled into bed, and took no more food from that moment until his last breath passed. As for Fleur, with each day she improved in small changes. First her gaze focused, the next night her skin was cool and damp. 
She was clear-headed, and after a week, she remembered what had befallen her family, how they had taken sick so suddenly, gone under. With her memory, mine came back only too sharp. I was not prepared to think of the people I had lost, or to speak of them, although we did, carefully, without letting their names loose in the wind that would reach their ears. We feared that they would hear us and never rest, come back out of pity for the loneliness we felt. They would sit in the snow outside the door, waiting until from longing we joined them. We would all be together on the journey then, our destination, the village, at the end of the road, where people gamble day and night, but never lose their money, eat but never fill their stomachs, drink but never leave their minds. The snow receded long enough for us to dig the ground with picks. As tribal police, Pukwan's son was forced by regulation to help bury the dead. So again we took the dark road to Machi Manito, the son leading rather than the father. We spent the day chipping at the earth until we had a hole long and deep enough to lay the pillagers shoulder to shoulder. Then we covered them and built five small board houses. I scratched out their clan markers, four cross-hatched bears and a marten. Then Pukwan Jr. shouldered the government's tools and took off down the path. I settled myself near the graves. I asked those pillagers, as I had asked my own children and wives, to leave us now and never come back. I offered tobacco, smoked a pipe of red willow for the old man. I told them not to pester their daughter just because she had survived or to blame me for finding them, or Pukwon Jr. for leaving too soon. I told them that I was sorry, but they must abandon us. I insisted, but the pillagers were as stubborn as the Nanapush clan and would not leave my thoughts. I think they followed me home. All the way down the trail, just beyond the edges of my sight, they flickered thin as needles, shadows piercing shadows. The sun had set by the time I got back, but Fleur was awake, sitting in the dark as if she knew. She never moved to build up the fire, never asked where I had been. I never told her either, and as the days passed, we spoke even less, always with roundabout caution. We felt the spirits of the dead so near that at length, we just stopped talking. This made it worse. Their names grew within us, swelled to the brink of our lips, forced our eyes open in the middle of the night. We were filled with the water of the drowned, cold and black, airless water that lapped against the seal of our tongues or leaked slowly from the corners of our eyes. Within us, like ice shards, their names bobbed and shifted then the slivers of ice began to collect and cover us. We became so heavy, weighted down with the lead gray frost, that we could not move. Our hands lay on the table like cloudy blocks. The blood within us grew thick. We needed no food and little warmth. Days passed, weeks, and we didn't leave the cabin for fear we'd crack our cold and fragile bodies. We had gone half Windigo. I learned later that this was common, that there were many of our people who died in this manner, of the invisible stick sickness. There were those who could not swallow another bite of food because the names of their dead anchored their tongues. There were those who let their blood stop and who took the road west after all. But one day, the new priest, just a boy really, opened our door. 
A dazzling and painful light flooded through and surrounded Fleur and me. Another pillager was found, the priest said. Fleur's cousin Moses was alive in the woods. Numb, stupid as bears in a winter den, we blinked at the priest's slight silhouette. Our lips were parched, stuck together. We could hardly utter a greeting, but we were saved by one thought. A guest must eat. Fleur gave Father Damien her chair and put wood on the gray coals. She found flour for gauntlet. I went to fetch snow to boil for tea water, but to my amazement, the ground was bare. I was so surprised that I bent over and touched the soft, wet earth. My voice was, <clears throat> my voice rasped at first when I tried to speak, but then, oiled by strong tea, lard, and bread, I was often talking. Even a sledge won't stop me once I start. Father Damien looked astonished and then wary as I began to creak and roll. I gathered speed. I talked both languages in streams that ran alongside each other, over every rock, around every obstacle. The sound of my own voice convinced me I was alive. I kept Father Damien listening all night, his green eyes round, his thin face straining to understand his odd brown hair and curls and clipped knots. Occasionally, he took in air as if to add observations of his own, but I pushed him under with my words. I don't know when it was that your mother slipped out. She was too young and had no stories or depth of life to rely upon. All she had was raw power and the names of the dead that filled her. I can speak them now. They have no more interest in any of us. Old Pillager, Augie Makwe, Boss Woman, his wife, Asasa We Minkyu Wessens, Choke Cherry Girl, Bainshi, Small Bird, also known as Josette, and the last boy. The boy, Ombashi, he is lifted by the wind. There was the other, a pillager cousin named Moses. He had survived, but as they later said of Fleur, he didn't know where he was anymore. This place of reservation surveys, or the other place, boundless, where the dead sit talking, see too much and regard the living as fools. And we were. Starvation makes fools of anyone. In the past, some had sold their allotment land for 100 pound weight of flour. Others, who were desperate to hold on, now urge that we get together and buy back our land, or at least pay a tax and refuse the lumbering money that would sweep the marks of our boundaries off the map like a pattern of straws. Many were determined not to allow the hired surveyors, or even our own people, to enter the deepest bush. They spoke of the guides Hat and many women, now dead, who had taken the government pay. But that spring, outsiders went in as before, and some of us too. The purpose was to measure the lake. Only now they walked upon the fresh graves of pillagers, crossed death roads to plot out the deepest water where the lake monster, Miss Shepeshu, hid himself and waited. Stay here with me, I said to Fleur when she came to visit. She refused. The land will go, I told her. The land will be sold and measured. But she tossed back her hair and walked off down the path with nothing to eat till thaw but a bag of my onions and a sack of oats. Who knows what happened? She returned to Machi Manito and stayed there alone in the cabin that even fire did not want. A young girl had never done such a thing before. 
I heard that in those months she was asked for fee money on all four allotments, even the island where Moses hid. The agent went out there, then got lost, spent a whole night following the moving lights and lamps of people who would not answer him, but talked and laughed amongst themselves. They only let him go at dawn because he was so stupid. Yet he asked Fleur again for money. And the next thing we heard, he was living in the woods and eating roots, gambling with ghosts. Every year, there are more who come looking for profit, who draw lines across the sand with their strings and yellow flags. They disappear sometimes. And now there are so many bedding with sticks and dice out near Machu Manito at night that you wonder how Fleur sleeps, or if she sleeps at all. Why should she? She does without so many things. The company of the living, ammunition for her gun. Some have ideas. You know how old chickens scratch and gabble. That's how the tale started. All the gossip, the wondering, all the things people said without knowing and then believed, since they heard it with their own ears, from their own lips, each word. I was never one to take notice of the talk of those who fattened in the shade of the new agent's storehouse. But I watched the wagons take the rutted turnoff to Machu Manito. Few of them returned, it is true. But those that did were enough, loaded high with hard green wood. From where we sit now, granddaughter, I heard the groan and crack, felt the grounds tremble as each tree slammed earth. I weakened into an old man as one oak went down, another and another was lost. As a gap form here, a clearing there, and plain daylight entered. <laughs>